Well, good afternoon, folks. Thank you for joining our webinar series today. My name is Tyson Mavar, one of the retirement focused advisors for Exxon Mobil employees here in Texas for the retirement group. And on today's webinar series, we're going to go over some of the most common mistakes that we've seen Exxon Mobil employees make and that we've tried to help employees avoid as they approach their transition from Exxon Mobil. We're going to talk a little bit about tax strategies, talking about the benefits plans and interest rates. And some of the important issues that we've found that most employees should consider as they approach uh, the point that they're leaving the company to have the most money possible and the least risk of running out of money as possible. Those of you who aren't as familiar with our company, the Retirement Group is an independent financial planning organization. We work with corporate employees throughout the country, and ExxonMobil happens to be one of the companies that we've helped many employees retire from over the last 30 plus years that we've been in business. We hope that if you choose to work with an advisory group in retirement, that we're high on that list after you've had an opportunity to speak with us. And I'll also talk to you throughout the presentation about some of the complimentary services that we have for employees prior to retirement that we found are very helpful in understanding the issues better and making better choices throughout that planning process. So that again, you just have as much money possible to go around after you leave ExxonMobil. We also have a questions box. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. We'll try to get to them throughout the presentation. Uh, you can also call us at the home office if you have any specific questions or would like to schedule a 15 to 30 minute web meeting or conference call with one of our ExxonMobil folks advisors. We'll do our best to get you on somebody's calendar that's a convenient time for you. And Ultimately, there's a whole host of different analyses we have available for employees. The cash flow analysis is probably our most popular and what I believe to be the most important. We also have an NUA analysis to take a look at your cost basis of your company stock and see if that might be a strategy that you ought to consider uh, as you approach leaving the company or maybe well after you've left the company. And a social security analysis to help people identify when's a good time to take social security given all of the different circumstances that you have and all of the variables that go into that decision. Uh, if you are not following us on LinkedIn yet, I encourage you to as we repost these videos and have a whole host of different uh, recorded videos that we've done over the last few years on some of the most important retirement strategies for ExxonMobil employees. So the QR code here, if you take a picture of it, uh, it'll get you a link to our LinkedIn page or you can follow us if you'd like to. So we're going to talk about quite a bit today. There's been some changes to the tax code that have affect retirees and specifically ExxonMobil retirees. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And we'll talk about the benefits plan, some of the mistakes that we've seen employees make, and also some retirement distribution strategies, how that's changed over the years and our philosophy in that, and things you ought to consider depending on your situation and where your assets are held and the different types of accounts you have money after you leave ExxonMobil. So first, let's talk about the SECURE Act. Required minimum distributions are something that the IRS imposes on us. It used to be at age 70 and a half. Now it's at 72. This is when you have to start taking money out of your retirement accounts and you have to start paying taxes on those accounts at ordinary income rates. Now, a lot of you on today's call probably are nowhere near age 72 yet and probably don't think this is all that relevant. However, there comes in many employees' retirement uh, point where they are forced into higher income tax brackets, and if they're not preparing for this at all, it could be a ticking time bomb of your retirement account, especially if you're somebody like myself who thinks that tax rates in the United States are probably scheduled to go up in the not-so-distant future. This is an uncertainty that we have faced with, and uh, many of my clients from ExxonMobil have the vast majority of their retirement savings in pre-tax accounts, it'll be taxed at some future rate. But what these required minimum distributions do to us is give us a forced tax that we might not necessarily want or might not necessarily be able to control. However, by understanding these distributions and planning to avoid them down the road, it'll give us a lot more flexibility in our retirement account and we do that through going through our cash flow analysis, seeing maybe some different ways that you can save now other than all in pre-tax assets in the 401k plan at Voya. Especially if you're somebody who has restricted stock at ExxonMobil, this would give you more flexibility. And once we get to the slide talking about retirement distribution strategies, you'll see more of why it makes a lot of sense in many cases 
to have different types of taxable accounts in retirement. And this is one of the reasons the required minimum distributions. Now, it used to be that when a non-spouse beneficiary, so typically this is your kids in most cases, but not necessarily, non-spouse beneficiaries used to be able to stretch out withdrawals from inherited retirement accounts over the course of their rest of their life. This is no longer the case for any non-spouse beneficiary that inherits a retirement account, such as your pension lump sum, your 401k, or at least most of the assets in that 401k, and a traditional IRA, now they have to distribute those assets and pay taxes on those assets within a 10-year time frame. So it used to be maybe a 30 or 40-year time frame for children that inherited retirement accounts. Now that's accelerated to a 10-year time frame. Now they get to pick and choose how quickly they take money out of that account. So it might be the best strategy to take equal distributions every year for the 10-year period or you might wanna be more strategic if you see some high tax years in the future, maybe those you'd prefer to take less money out of the inherited IRA and more money out in the lower tax years. So there is some flexibility here, but this could be a reason that uh, you as a retiree might wanna update your estate plan and we'll do this in the cash flow analysis as well. Or if you're somebody who has a parent that either recently passed away or may pass away in the future with retirement assets, you need to incorporate this into your strategy. At least be aware of how these will change your tax brackets and force some income on you, uh, potentially not the best time in your retirement. So talk to us about this or whoever you're working with as a retirement advisor on the importance of this in your plan. It affects everybody differently. Now, there used to be age restrictions on IRA contributions. Uh, used to be that you were not able to contribute to a retirement account after 70 and a half. Uh, new rule states that you can do this. And this, of course, you're going to have to have earned income to be able to do this, whether it's a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. Uh, this could make some sense, especially if you get a part-time job in retirement. Uh, a lot of our ExxonMobil clients left the company and either went back as a contractor or consultant or did something completely different in retirement that was less stressful, maybe fewer hours a week. Uh, it could be a reason to either reduce what you're taking out of your IRAs or maybe even potentially consider to contribute, continue contributing to your IRAs even beyond the age of 70 and a half. Now, probably one of my favorite slides here, we're gonna zoom in a little bit. Uh, first, we'll look at the ordinary income tax rates for 2022. Most of you know that these change pretty much every year, uh, not just the thresholds at which you need to stay within to maintain a marginal income tax bracket, but also the tax brackets changed uh, only about four years ago, five years ago. And we expect these to continue to change. Now, they might lock them in for a few years at a time, but tax reform is one of the constants that we see in the United States with changing regimes in Washington, DC and changing deficits and national debt amounts, we'll probably be seeing some higher income tax brackets. So you wanna put this into your plan and an expectation so you can prepare for a potentially a harsher tax environment in your retirement. And that may change your ideas on how to contribute to your 401k now and how to start distributing your assets in the early years of retirement, maybe even considering some Roth conversions, especially in the early years of retirement. Uh, we have a question that just came in. Before we get back to this, I'm gonna uh, ask this and answer this question. How much time do I have before interest rates start significantly reducing my pension? Well, I'm actually going to go back to that one once we get to the pension interest rate slide, because I think it will make more sense once we look at the current interest rates and start to visualize where those could be going and what the impact's going to be short term and long term on the lump sums. Uh, before we do that, let's talk also about long term capital gains rates. So this is if you sell an asset for more than you bought it for, such as ExxonMobil stock, for instance, and you held that asset for more than a year hence the long-term capital gains. If you held it for less than a year, it'd be considered a short-term capital gain and would fall under these income tax brackets. This, you, as you can see here, the income taxes are much higher than capital gains taxes in almost every scenario. For instance, if you have total taxable income 
uh, anywhere from 41,675 up to 459,000 and some change. You're in the 15% uh, capital gains tax bracket. And this is for uh, individual filers. Now, it's going to be more expensive if you have a really high income year. And this is where we want to be very careful about selling appreciated assets in a non-qualified account, such as if you do the NUA strategy and move some of your shares to an individual or joint non-qualified investment account. And this will play a role in your distribution strategy. If you have some appreciated stock that you need to sell to create income, we want to be careful of how much income you have so as not to force you into a higher uh, both income tax bracket and capital gains tax bracket. Something else a lot of people don't realize is if you have income as a married filer, uh, joint filer, over 250000 in any given year, your capital gains taxes go up by 3.8%. This is called net investment income tax or NIIT. So this also should be considered when selling stock and when creating a distribution strategy because that may not sound like a lot, 3.8%, but if you have quite a few Exxon Mobil shares that are uh, pretty well appreciated and this NUA strategy makes sense to you, we wanna keep those taxes as low as possible to maximize the tax savings opportunity of that NUA strategy. And so you can see there's a lot of moving parts here and we have to be very careful about not only selling assets, but choosing which account to pull from in retirement. And this is why a lot of people choose to work with a skilled team of retirement distribution experts, so they don't overpay in taxes as well as uh, so that they get to protect and grow their money as best as possible through the investments. Uh, another question came in, how will inflation affect my pension if I choose the annuity option? Well, I think that's a good segue into the uh, pension plan and the pension options. And let's see, uh, uh, we have a slide that's coming up here. I wanna talk about this one, but let's talk about this. Inflation will affect both your pension lump sum and annuity option. Uh, many of you know higher inflation is correlated with higher interest rates. And many of you also know that higher interest rates is correlated with lower lump sum payouts. And this is both for grandfathered and non-grandfathered employees. So regardless of when you started your career, uh, where you started your career, even if you started at XTO, your lump sum is going to move inversely with interest rates and rising inflation is likely to come with higher interest rates and lower lump sum payouts. We've already seen some of the highest inflation in about 40 years, just last year. And we've already seen the interest rates start to creep up. In fact, the second quarter interest rate is higher than the first quarter interest rate for most employees, meaning you're probably losing some money on your lump sum going into the second quarter. Wasn't too bad in this next quarter but this could very feasibly continue to happen every single quarter. And we'll probably see an even larger spike in future quarters than we saw from this quarter to next quarter. So it's definitely something you wanna be aware of. The way that inflation affects your annuity option is of course, because your annuity is uh, not adjusted for cost of living increases. Meaning that if your annuity is projected to be 5,000 a month for the rest of your life, 30 years later, you'll still be getting the same $5,000 a month. And that $5,000 a month might only buy you uh, half as much as it did when you retired or even less uh, 20 to 30 years down the road. So inflation, not great for either the lump sum or uh, the annuity. But what a lot of people have done in recent years is given an assumption that interest rates will be higher bonds and fixed income assets will pay more in the future. This is one of the reasons the lump sum has been very, very popular in recent years uh, as an ability to hedge against inflation and help our assets grow at a rate that's at least consistent with the rising prices and hopefully even more than what our cost of living is increasing over the course of our retirement. This is a really good slide. I didn't want to skip this one. Uh, we're going to zoom in here to show you these are state income tax rates that are in addition to federal income tax rates by state. And so it's not necessarily where you made the money. In fact, it's not where you made the money, it's where you withdraw the money from your retirement account. So where you reside in retirement. I have some clients that reside in multiple states, uh, but more recently I've been seeing clients and many of my clients retire here in Texas, but leave the state of Texas. And my question is always why, because it's one of the more favorable states. You can see all these states in white do not tax income. And most states do tax income, some at higher rates than others. 
So our best advice is if you can avoid it, avoid living in the states that are in dark blue and try to air toward the states that are in white or light blue, because it could mean hundreds of thousands of savings and tax dollars throughout the course of your retirement. And in our, tax, our uh, cash flow analysis, we also will help you compare retiring in two different states. I had somebody that was considering leaving Colorado and moving to either South Carolina or Tennessee. Tennessee, of course, has no state income tax. Uh, South Carolina does, but it's not nearly as bad as California or New York. And you could see that they had less money, but in their case, it wasn't enough to convince them to not move to South Carolina, which was their ideal state of choice to retire in. All right, we had some uh, tax changes recently come out as well as some proposed tax changes that we will probably see some of come to fruition. So let's talk about some of those. Current changes, a lot of them were uh, due to the pandemic and unprecedented stimulus by the federal and state governments to uh, support the economy. A Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, the American Rescue Plan, these were multi-trillion dollar bills that were unfinanced, meaning that we're gonna to have to pay for them eventually, but they did have some support in helping our economy get through the pandemic and also help the stock market maintain pretty well uh, through the end of 2020 and throughout 2021. We had deduction and, fed it, uh, deduction and credit phase out adjustments happening, uh, plan changes to alternative minimum taxes, uh, AMT, as many of you know, not everybody uh, falls under these, but some people do, and it forces you to have to pay an income tax even if you don't have a whole lot of income. There's changes happening coming up in the future. There's going to be changes to retirement plan distributions. Uh, in fact, this actually happened just this year that they increased the, or excuse me, they decreased the percentages meaning that your required minimum distribution likely dis decreased if you're already taking required minimum distributions. Uh, but as you, many of you know, those increase every year as we get older. So if you start at, let's say, uh, close to 4%, a couple of years later, you're gonna be forced to take out about 5% per year. And that number just continues going up as you get older. Uh, CARES Act provisions, uh, some of them expired in 2020. Uh, many of them actually expire some of the advantages that we had in 2020, such as uh, the deadline changing, our ability to borrow money from IRAs and 401ks and withdraw money prior to 59 and a half. Those expired at the end of 2020. And we have uh, long-term care insurance premiums changing. Much of this is due to more people needing long-term care and therefore it being more expensive for insurance companies to offer and now more expensive to those of us to uh, insure through the premiums that we pay. Uh, health savings accounts, uh, rules on those have changed in terms of contributions and some of the advantages of uh, health savings accounts or HSAs and then flexible spending accounts. Those are the ones that you, it's lose it or use it or lose it. If you do not use those funds in a given year, you won't be able to roll them over into the next year, but the limits are higher. And for those of us that have a lot of medical expenses, in some cases, those can be great ways to save for healthcare expenses. Now, some of these proposed changes, um, many of you remember tax rates were a little bit higher prior to the 2017 tax reform. Uh, they're looking at going back to Obama era top tax rates of 39.6%, not a huge increase. They're 37% now, but it's certainly not favorable for those of us that are in that tax bracket or might be several years in our retirement. Uh, taxing long-term capital gains as ordinary income. We saw how favorable the long-term capital gains rates are in a previous slide compared to ordinary income rates. That could not potentially be the case forever. Uh, taxing unrealized capital gains at death. Uh, this is essentially getting rid of the step up in cost basis that we currently enjoy. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, if you inherit an appreciated asset that's not in a retirement account, uh, the capital gain that was enjoyed in the original owner's lifetime disappears and the cost basis gets stepped up to the value on the date of their death. Of course, you'll have future capital gains taxes on any future appreciation, but this is very possibly going away in the not so distant future and it might be a reason for you to reconsider your estate plan for those of you that have highly appreciated assets 
in your retirement plan. Uh, we talked about NIIT earlier, uh, applying 3.8% also to passive, uh, active pass-through business income. Uh, this is just another increase in taxes to increase tax revenue to help to pay some of the bills that we've accrued in the last couple of years through this pandemic. Uh, extending the enhanced child tax credit. This is a benefit for uh, mostly for lower income families. Uh, making the uh, relief package changes permanent. Uh, this is also having to do with many of these credits for lower income families and to make expanded health insurance premium tax credits permanent. So a lot of proposals on the table, folks. We're gonna be following this. And as soon as these reforms start to come out, you better believe we'll be talking about these in our webinars because it could, again, mean more changes to how you're saving, when you ought to retire, and how you create the distribution strategy in a re retirement plan. All right, so let's talk about some of the rules. We had some good questions earlier on the pension plan. This is the slide I was referring to. Uh, as many of you know, rising interest rates result in lower lump sum payouts. Depending on when you started your career, will define which interest rate they're using. And just really quickly, I'll go through these grandfathered rates because there's not that many employees anymore that are grandfathered as they're being phased out. So first of all, to be grandfathered, you had to be retirement eligible by 2012. So many of you know the 55 and 15 years of service benchmark. You had to have that by 2012. Uh, so here we are 10 years later. So by that logic, you have to be 65 with 25 years of service by the end of this year, 2020, or excuse me, 2022. To be grandfathered and therefore use these more favorable 30-year treasury interest rates that did not change, as it turns out, going into the second quarter. They're still going to be 1.75, uh, still higher than we saw uh, the lowest rates in history, 1.25 back in quarter one, 2021, just a year ago. Uh, but very, very low historically still and uh, potentially going up in the not so distant future. Uh, these rates, they look at two quarters prior to the quarter you commence your benefit. So it's not related to your retirement date. It's related to the day you start your benefit, which is not always uh, right next to each other. So for instance, you could retire by uh, March 31st, commence your benefit April 1st. And there's a special rule for grandfathered employees where they'll let you keep the previous quarter's interest rates. However, most employees fall under these non-grandfathered provisions, which have their lump sums calculated based on corporate bond interest rates. And to get the first quarter interest rate, so this is for all you XTO employees and anybody who's not 65 with 25 years of service by the end of this year, you actually have to retire by uh, February to commence your benefit by March 1st to lock in the first quarter interest rate. Because if you retired in March, your earliest available commencement date would be April 1st, which as it turns out, is in the second quarter. And so this is why timing is everything with this decision, especially if you're taking all or even just a portion of your pension as a lump sum. So what do these rates actually mean? Well, we have the first segment, which is based on short-term corporate bonds and is discounting the future annuities from years zero through five of retirement. Second segment rate based on uh, intermediate term corporate bonds and is discounting years five through 20 of your uh, future annuity payments back to a lump sum, which as you can see is three times more relevant than the first segment rate. And then the third segment rate is discounting years 20 through life, which you know if you're retiring at 55, your life expectancy is probably in the mid 80s. So you have about a 30 year life expectancy, uh, which would make this segment worth 10 years. The older you are, the less relevant this third segment becomes, however. So this is why there's a lot of moving parts and everybody has different combinations of age and service. It's really helpful to use the online modeler that you can access through EDA without your PIN number if you have a work laptop or you can access through the benefits website. However, you do need a PIN number to get in through that one. And we spend a lot of time with our clients as they approach their retirement date to figure out when's the best retirement date, when's the best commencement date, which you know might be several quarters after their retirement date, or maybe even several years after their retirement date. 
And also which pension option makes the most sense given your circumstances. It might not always be a full lump sum even in this low interest rate environment. Important rule of thumb to remember here, every 1% increase to interest rates is roughly a 10% drop in your lump sum. And this is a function also of your age. The older you are, the less severe that impact is. Usually for a 65 year old, it might only be an 8% uh, drop in the lump sum for every 1% increase to the rates. Whereas for a 55 year old, it might be a 12% drop in the lump sum for every 1% increase to rates. We just had a question coming here. So if I terminate at 62, can I still get 100% of my pension if I don't take it until 65? This is an interesting question, great question. Um, at 62, you are past the age penalty benchmark of 60, so you're getting 100% of your pension. However, remember, there's a life expectancy function of the lump sum calculation, and the older you get, the less the company has to give you in a lump sum. So I can't imagine why you would be deferring your pension uh, lump sum or annuity from 62 to 65. The annuity, it's almost a no-brainer to take it right away. And there could be some tax implications that we'd want to look at. But the lump sum, the only reason you'd want to defer it is if you see interest rates going down in the future, driving your lump sum up at a faster rate than your life expectancy decrease is driving your lump sum down. So you can see there's a lot of moving parts here, but uh, in most cases, if you're already age 60 when you retire from the company, it doesn't make sense to defer either the lump sum or the annuity because on the lump sum, uh, not only are you losing ground to your life expectancy, but you should be earning some interest on that money uh, as soon as possible, rolling it over to an IRA or your 401k and investing that money. And on the annuity, the longer you defer it, you're just giving up uh, payments. You're wasting a monthly payment for every month you defer it. Uh, but if you're under 60, there could be some uh, incentive to defer the pension um, until potentially age 60, unless we see a rising interest rate environment. A lot to remember. Uh, typically, when somebody retires from ExxonMobil, they, if they're taking a lump sum, they'll roll that over to a traditional IRA. Uh, they can roll that over to their 401k. Uh, the, typically, the only reason you would do that is if you're not yet 59 and a half and need some penalty-free income prior to 59 and a half. You can do that through the post-55 distribution strategy, which is part of the IRS code 72T. Allows you to get penalty-free income before 59 and a half. Uh, most people prefer an IRA to a 401k because substantially more investment options. Uh, also, most people are not comfortable doing all of this on their own, creating the distribution strategy, uh, reallocating the investments and making changes to those investments periodically in retirement. That's why most people work with a retirement advisor. And in most cases, like in our company's instance, we use Charles Schwab for a custodian. You have substantially more investment options in your IRA than you do in your 401k. So in a lot of cases, your ability to protect and grow those assets are better when you have more options. You also need to be uh, aware and cognizant of fees and the cost of those services. And if you're not getting anything for the cost, then you'd probably just want to uh, reduce your costs as much as possible. So some people will leave money in their 401k plan, at least until they've chosen an advisor to help them with these. But most people, we encourage people meet with several different advisory groups, and we don't claim to be the best fit for everybody. In fact, we've turned down business from people that we didn't think it was a good fit because of uh, philosophies not being in line but we think we're a pretty good option and we hope that you at least decide to meet with us so you can verify for yourself if we're the best option for you. Now, if you do have some after-tax money in your 401k, you may wanna consider rolling that to your Roth IRA. If you have some appreciated stock in your 401k, which many of our clients do, especially those that have worked there for several decades, you might wanna consider moving those to a non-qualified brokerage account through what's called net unrealized appreciation or NUA. And while you're still working, you want to make sure you're maximizing the tax code as well as the rules on your benefit plan through ExxonMobil. And by saving tax efficiently and structuring your contributions of the 401k so that you can minimize your tax bracket down the road. This may mean contributing on an after-tax basis periodically or potentially through a special contribution to the plan. Many of you know 
You can contribute up to 20% of your salary by Exxon Mobil plan rules, but you also have some contribution limits that are imposed on you by the IRS. So you wanna be aware of all these so you can really optimize your saving and then ultimately have more flexibility when you retire, after you retire, to navigate the tax code efficiently and minimize your lifetime tax bill, really. All right, we're getting close on time here. So we're gonna go through some conventional withdrawal strategies, what the old school of thought used to be, it was easy to remember because it was just an order of operations. Unfortunately, what we found in many cases is that the easiest route is not the best route. And so we're gonna talk also about the tax informed withdrawal strategy. It's something that we work customly with our clients after they leave ExxonMobil. So first let's talk about the conventional withdrawal strategy. Uh, order of operations, spend your taxable money. So this is money in the bank, money in the non-qualified brokerage account, spend that first. That used to be the uh, conventional wisdom. Then move on to your tax deferred assets. This would be the pre-tax money in your IRA, your 401k, that's fully taxable at ordinary income rates, but still enjoying tax deferral until you withdraw the assets from the account. And then last but not least, spend your Roth IRA money or tax exempt money, because that's the most valuable, the power of tax-free compounding growth, uh, very great over a long period of time. And what happens, we've uh, given an example scenario here of somebody who retired at 65, and spent all their money, or we at least just ran it out to age 95, even if they didn't spend all their money. What happens here? Social Security needs to be incorporated in this plan, right? It's a, an income stream that will reduce what you have to take out of other accounts, but it might not be available necessarily immediately when you retire. This person spent through their taxable assets halfway through year two of retirement. Their tax bracket was effectively zero other than some capital gains and dividend taxes they probably had on some of the assets in that taxable account. Then they switched over to IRA withdrawals to complement their social security income. And then eventually ran out of IRA money and were left with Roth money, which also plummeted their tax bracket where, as it looks like, age 83. So basically had really high tax brackets from age 67 to age 83 and no too little income in the first year and a half of retirement and then at the end of their retirement because of all that Roth money that they had saved up. Taxes paid was about 36,000 over the course of their life. In this example, you may have a spending goal of twice or triple what this is, which would make the tax savings that much more greater for that much greater for doing the uh, non-conventional wisdom and what we found is the Tax informed withdrawal strategy. And this is something like I mentioned earlier, we customize for each one of our clients. All right, so the goal here is to fill up the lower tax brackets with pre tax money or withdrawals from IRA in most cases, and fill up the higher tax brackets with tax free money or money that's not taxed at ordinary income rates, like your Roth IRA and your brokerage account. Look what happened here. This person's money lasted two years longer. They're just because of the tax savings that they had, they had two years more of income, which in their case was about $120,000 in tax savings. Uh, that's a pretty big deal for somebody who's cutting it close on their retirement plan, who, where estate planning is a secondary objective and just having enough money to live comfortably in retirement is the primary objective. So you can see here, this makes a big difference. One strategy that we've been doing with uh, several of our clients in the last couple of years that had quite a bit of restricted stock and non-qualified accounts is have them selling some of those shares and spending that money so they could effectively be in a very low tax bracket. Then at the end of the year, doing a very, very large Roth conversion, only up to the next tax bracket that we thought was a reasonable one. And over a very short period of time, two, three, four years, you can get a lot of money out of your IRA into a Roth IRA and be in a very low tax bracket at the same time giving us a lot more flexibility to do things like what we've seen here in this tax informed withdrawal strategy. Uh, so just bullet points here. Step one, fill up lower tax brackets with tax deferred income each year. Step two, be aware that Social Security is partially taxable, but it's still taxable. And strategically utilize both our taxable and tax exempt assets to manage our tax bracket and to make our money just last longer by paying less taxes because of our progressive 
uh, income tax bracket in our tax cut in the United States. Uh, here's some special situations for some of the penalties uh, and the rules for withdrawing money prior to 59 and a half, uh, medical expenses, health insurance, disability, inherited IRAs, you don't have to uh, take money out or you don't have to pay a penalty on withdrawals prior to 59 and a half uh, on inherited IRAs. Uh, the life expectancy rule, I mentioned 72T earlier, also post 55 distributions for those of you that leave money in your 401k and aren't yet 59 and a half. Qualified higher education expenses, first time home purchase, a very limited amount, but still an option. Uh, qualified reservist distributions, childbirth, the IRS 415 uh, limits. This is for those of you that are highly compensated employees that have to take or aren't able to roll over all of your pension or 401k. This is called the SSP or SPP, the Supplemental Pension Plan and Supplemental Savings Plan. You'll see that on your VOIA statement as the SSP and on your pension projections as a non-qualified makeup benefit that's a supplemental pension plan. And then net and realized appreciation, a way that we utilize this to give people access in some cases to penalty-free money after uh, they've left the company if they're not yet 59 and a half. And then the years from 59 and a half to 72 in current tax law now, you have complete, complete flexibility on how much money and when you're taking it out of your retirement accounts. But then again, at 72, now you're forced to take a certain amount of money out. If you don't, it's a 50% penalty on what you didn't take out. We never want to pay that one if we can avoid it. And ultimately, just understanding where these rules play a role in our particular situation. All of you are different, even though you all work for ExxonMobil or maybe care about somebody that works for ExxonMobil. You're going to have different circumstances, different amounts of money that you save, different tax bracket status, different ages at which you're retiring, different values, you know, people that you are responsible for taking care of in retirement other than just yourself. All of these circumstances will change what strategy makes more sense to have the money go around as long as it possibly can, or at least as long as it needs to, which of course is the rest of your life. Fortunately, 74% of Americans over the age of 50 do not have a written plan for their retirement. And this is not acceptable folks, whether it's us or some other peers of ours in the industry, take time to put this together ahead of time and revisit it periodically. Not only will this help you improve your position to retire, with more money potentially, but it's also gonna be a good exercise to go through this and figure out who is the best fit for you to help you through this process. It might not necessarily be the retirement group, but we have a very long track record of helping people in your situation from ExxonMobil retire successfully and put together a very sustainable retirement plan. Uh, some of the issues that people have brought up to us as important in their advisor and what people are looking for when they get a second opinion in most cases, uh, do they understand the ExxonMobil benefits? And also, have they retired people from ExxonMobil in the past? Probably not a bad idea to find a group that has done that and has a good track record. Uh, what are the costs of the service? This is different across every advisory group. And we keep our costs well below 1% in most cases. It's a very competitive market, as many advisory groups would like your business as an ExxonMobil employee because of very valuable benefits plans over the last 30 years. Uh, but make sure you understand what the costs are, what are the variables, how do I keep my costs down, or where are there areas where I don't want to cut costs too much because it's going to give me a big risk later down the road, whether it's from a uh, level of service or whether it's from just uh, getting too cheap on the investments and not getting good investments as a result. Uh, are they working with an experienced team? We have a very uh, good long track record team that helps me and the other representatives that actually talk to clients do better at what we like to do, which is talk to clients, but make sure that whoever you work with not only has an experienced team behind the scenes, but also has a deep roster of advisors in case your advisor retires during your retirement or just happens to leave the industry for whatever reason. And you know, ultimately asking, what do you offer? What do I get for what I'm paying your group? I think is a, a reasonable question to ask. Uh, so whether it's help like we talked about with the tax distribution strategy, uh, the investment plan, what's the company's philosophy and how's it done over the years? And also, what do you know about the ExxonMobil benefits? If you talk to a few groups, you'll probably learn pretty quickly who knows the benefits plans best. And that might be one of the 
boxes that you want to check as you're selecting who's going to help you through this process. So you can have confidence you're not going to make any mistakes. And then, like we talked about that complimentary cash flow analysis, we don't charge anything for it because that's how we grow our business. Even the people that do that with us that don't end up becoming clients, we usually get a lot of referrals from those same people and have developed some pretty good relationships over the years for doing that. So don't pay for this because there's a variety of groups that'll do it for you complimentary and you probably want to get several done, even if it's showing you the exact same information, which usually it's not, but even if it was, just going through the exercise of having somebody review that with you, it's going to tell you a lot about that group and the individual who's presenting it to you and asking you questions about the importance of your retirement. So take us up on it, folks. No cost other than a little bit of your time. Uh, if you'd like to request that cash flow analysis or just ask some specific questions to myself or any of my coworkers that work with ExxonMobil employees, you could call us at the home office, 800-900-5867. You can email us at info at the retirementgroup.com and go to our website, the retirementgroup.com, or you can schedule an appointment with us through this QR code. Uh, we'll get you on the calendar or just follow along with some of the content that we post on our LinkedIn page. So you can make sure that topics that are interesting and relevant to you, you can get some insight from a group that has done this for a long time for people in your same situation. With that, we're going to wrap it up for today's call. I appreciate everybody joining us. We went a little bit longer than we normally do, but we had a lot to talk about. So I appreciate you hanging in there with me. I can get long-winded on some of these topics that I'm really passionate about. Uh, but we hope to talk to you all very soon. In the meantime, have a safe, good rest of your week and take good care.